Hello? Can I get everyone to take their seats, please? Hello. everyone, thank you so much for being here. My name is Miro Karanha and I'm the co-founder and publisher of Our Daily Planet. And we're a daily morning email covering climate conservation and why these issues matter to all Americans. And if you're not already getting our tip sheet each morning, you can sign up for free at ourdailyplanet.com. And really at the heart of ODP, is the idea that the best chance we have to address the nature crisis is if as many Americans are informed as possible about what's happening to our planet and why. And it's why I'm so grateful to have a co-founder like Monica Medina. Many of you here may know Monica from her time as Deputy Administrator of NOAA in the Obama administration, a time before Sharpies <laughs> were used to redraw maps. Um, and she couldn't be here today, but she's been instrumental in planning this great event. But there couldn't be a more critical time to have conversations like the one we're gonna have today. Last fall, we were very excited to work with MSNBC to put on the Climate Forum 2020 and to host the, and we're thrilled to be partnering with National Geographic and the Weiss Campaign for Nature to put on events like this that help advance the conversations around conservation and the solutions we have to protect our precious planet for future generations. And with that, I'd like to introduce our great panelists that are here today. So it's United States Senator Tom Udall. Uh, senator Udall is the senior senator from New Mexico. He's currently serving his second term, and he's the son of former Interior Secretary Stuart Udall, who we are here honoring today. And Bruce Babbitt served as Secretary of the Interior from 1993 through 2001, and also as the Governor of Arizona from 1978 to 1987. Yeah, <laughs> Sally Jewell served as Secretary of the Interior from 2013 to 2017. Prior to her role in government, Sally was the CEO of REI and is currently the interim CEO of the Nature Conservancy. <laughs> Dr. Enrique Sala is a National Geographic Explorer in Residence. And last year, Dr. Sala co-authored a study in science advances, making the scientific case for protecting at least 30% of the planet by 2030. And Kendall Edmo is a member of the Blackfeet Tribe, serving as a Deputy Historic Preservation Officer for Conservation in the Blackfeet Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And we're so glad to have her with us today. And now I'll turn it over to the panelists to give some opening remarks before we dive into the panel discussion. And Senator, we'll uh, start with you. I thought we were starting with Enrique, but that's okay. I'm happy to, happy to lead here. I have in my remarks, Enrique, thank you for that great presentation. <laughs> <laughs> 
The, uh, I'm sure you're going to give a great presentation. You know, sci scientists, and I, I wanted at the beginning, because you'll see a couple of lessons in my remarks. When I say lesson, it means it's a Stuart Udall lesson, okay? Scientists like Enrique inform us and inspire all of us. My father was deeply influenced by another marine biologist turned author named Rachel Carson. When her book, Silent Spring, came out, Stuart stood up for her as the chemical industry was trying to destroy her, and it was a really sad time as to what they did. SLU lesson is we need scientists to speak truth to power, and we need them to speak truth to the American people, and all of us need to listen to our scientists. I begin, thank you. Thank you. And we, it maybe if with all the clapping, maybe we, I don't want to discourage the energy and everything, but we're trying to stream for an hour and 15 minutes. So, so thank you for doing that, but maybe save it for at the end and we'll have a big rousing thing going on. So um, I, first of all, I begin with a heartfelt thank you to National Geographic, the Weiss Campaign for Nature and our Daily Planet for honoring my father today, and I'm so glad to be joined by my wife, Jill, who's right here, my sister, Lori, who's at some place here. You know, she doesn't like me to introduce her, and my sister-in-law, Sue, I think is also here. And I want to welcome all of my fellow panelists and former Interior Department officials that are here, many of whom I've met this morning, and all the conservation advocates that are here. It's an honor to gather with you this morning, one week after what would have been my father's 100th birthday. Stuart Udall's legacy, he, January 31st, 1920, was when he was born. Stuart's legacy in St. John's, Arizona. Stuart Udall's legacy has a lot to teach us today as we confront the major crises facing the planet. During my father's first year as Secretary of the Interior, the head of the Bureau of Reclamation, flew him over southern Utah to show him the next big dam. My dad took one look down at the red rock spires below, and he didn't see a dam. He saw the next national park, and he went back to Washington and helped create Canyonlands National Park. That leads me to lesson two. Be bold, have a vision, and get rolling with it. My father saw the threats to our land, clean water, and clean air, and warned the nation in his 1963 book, The Quiet Crisis. He wrote, each generation has its own rendezvous with the land, for despite our fee titles and claims of ownership, we are all brief tenants on this planet. By choice or by default, we will carve out a land legacy for our heirs. He knew we needed to act with urgency, so he worked to pass many of the nation's bedrock conservation and environmental laws and preserve millions of acres of wild places. But Dad would not have wanted us to gather here just to talk about how great he was. Lori, you know that. He would have said, get on with that, you know. He, he, he would want us to focus on future generations. He would want us to move forward with our vision. Toward the end of his life, he wrote a letter to his grandchildren in 2008. And he said in that letter, this is the most important letter I will ever write. It concerns your future and the tomorrows of the innumerable human beings who share the vulnerable, fragile planet with you. It involves changes that must be made if environmental disasters are to be avoided. The response to this challenge will shape the future of the entire human race. Today, the climate and nature crises my dad warned of are upon us. They have risen to a crescendo that we cannot ignore. One million species are threatened by extinction. In North America, we've already lost three billion birds, three billion since 1970. In the U.S., we lose a football's field worth of habitat every 30 seconds. We're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction, this one human-caused. 
Combine this massive loss of nature with the devastating effects of climate change, and what does it add up to? An existential threat to our planet and the survival of humanity itself. So we must write a new playbook with the same energy my father summoned more than 50 years ago. My vision is threefold. First, we must save nature. This fall, I introduced the 30 by 30 resolution to save nature. We must protect 30% of our lands and oceans by 2030 to save the natural world as we know it. Second, we must confront climate change with everything we have, really motivate every single citizen and citizens of the world. We must transition quickly to a carbon-free economy. I've introduced my renewable electricity standard bill that gets us to a carbon-free energy sector by mid-century. And we should make our public lands pollution-free. Fossil fuel emissions from public lands account for almost one quarter of our CO2 emissions. Instead of being a source of pollution, public lands should be part of the solution. And third, the third visionary is um, environmental justice must be our North Star. Low income communities and communities of color bear the legacy of pollution. Native American lands have been desecrated as we transition to a clean energy economy, equity and inclusion must guide our work. No one can be left behind. I'll leave you with a final quote from my dad, again from his 2008 letter to his grandchildren. Go well, do well, my children, he said. Cherish sunsets, wild creatures and wild places, have a love affair with the wonder and beauty of the earth. Let's listen to my father's plea and write a new playbook to save the wonder and beauty of the earth. Thank you very much. I should have gone first. Madam Secretary, Mr. Secretary, Senator, dear friends, actually, wouldn't it be great if Senator Udall were the next uh, Secretary of the Interior of the next administration? <laughs> uh, you, we need another giant. We need another giant. Um, so what is crazy is that we have to debate whether we have to give more space to nature, right? We, this year, in October, we have the Conference of the Parties of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. It's the Convention of Nature. It's the parallel convention that was created at the Rio uh, Summit uh, too long ago to agree on how much space we're going to give to nature, how much nature we're going to protect. Everybody knows about the Paris Climate Agreement, right? We cannot exceed 1.5 degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels, but what about nature? Right now we have a goal of protecting 10% of the ocean and 17% of the land by the end of this year. We're almost there, but not yet. So the question is, uh, you know, why do we need to protect more? And it's crazy that we have to go and fight um, countries and corporations and uh, politicians that serve them in many countries to make them agree that we need to save more of our natural world. And you know, everything we need to survive depends on the work of other species. The oxygen we breathe comes not only from the plants of the land, but also from mostly from microbes and microscopic algae in the ocean. The clean water we drink, and you, know, you can ask people in New York, comes from the filtration that is produced naturally by forests, by healthy forests. The food we eat is, except that processed food that you can find here in the supermarket, the, there is actual food that is plants and animals. <laughs> and pollinating our crops, 75% of our crops are pollinated by insects, birds, and bats, and some mammals in some areas. So everything we need to survive depends on the work of other species. But we have become totally out of balance with the natural world. And it all can be distilled in one single 
sentence. You know, the world has become less wild. Today, 96% of the mass of mammals is us and our domesticated livestock. Only 4% is everything else, from bison to pandas to polar bears. 70% of the birds are our domesticated poultry, mostly chicken. 75% of the land has been altered in some way by human activities. 66% of the ocean has been also affected by mostly industrial fishing. 90% of the large fish of the ocean are gone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to depress you too much. But it, it's, 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 uh, we are replacing the wild with our domesticated plants and animals. Can we shift this around? Can we turn this back? And the answer is yes. And there are many solutions, but one solution that is probably the most cost efficient that we have seen work all around the world on land and in the ocean is protected areas. Areas that we set aside so nature can restore herself. And I'd like to show you three slides. Can we have the first slide, please? Three slides that shows what happens when you protect an area. The first slide that you are going to see in a few seconds, hopefully, um, <laughs> is a place in um, Mexico called Cabo Pulmo. Cabo Pulmo is this little place, this little community of fishermen. In the mid-90s, the fishermen were so upset with not having enough fish to catch that they did something that nobody expected. Instead of going after the last few fish left, they decided, there, you, there, you, there it is, they decided to stop fishing completely in an area of 70 square kilometers. This is Cabo Pulmo, it was an underwater desert. We went there in 1999 and did our scientific surveys and, and measured almost nothing. When we returned 10 years later, this is what we saw. Can we have the next one, please? Wow. That's the same place. Can we have the next one, please? No, there's another photo after, after this one. <laughs> um, that should um, raise another wow from the guy. <laughs> so much for the <laughs> intrigue here. Okay, so we saw this place come back to pristine in only 10 years, w and including the return, there you go, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> including the return of the large predators, like the sh groupers, the sharks, and the jacks. And you know who else is thriving? Those visionary fishermen, who now are making far more money from diving tourism inside the reserve and better fishing around it. Because w we have seen this miracle happen all around the world. When you protect an area in the ocean, on average, the biomass of fish increases 600% within the, its boundaries. 600% compared to unprotected areas nearby. And not only these fish are more abundant, they are larger. And they, pro they produce a disproportionately larger number of eggs, which helps to replenish the areas around, improving the fishing. So we're talking right now, less than 3% of the ocean is fully protected from fishing. 97% of the ocean is open to fishing of some kind. So that 97% of the ocean is like a checking account where everybody withdraws but nobody makes a deposit. That 3% that is fully protected is like a savings account with a principal that we set aside and grows with compound interest and produces these returns that we can enjoy around. This is what we can do to bring back the nature and all its services it provides. It, that, it, these places when they are protected, they not only produce more fish but also Natural grasslands absorb more water and prevent floods. Forests in healthy state capture more carbon and help us mitigate climate change. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And just to give you an example, in the United States, for every dollar that our government invests in our national parks, that dollar produces $10 in economic output that benefits US businesses. Right? So, the cost of inaction is much greater than the cost of action. We know that protected areas work, and the science is telling us that if we want to prevent that extinction of a million species, if we want nature to help us achieve the Paris climate goals by absorbing much of the excess carbon pollution that we expel into the atmosphere, we need half of the planet in natural state. And we can start by agreeing um, as a country and as an international community to protect now 
to agree now to protect 30% of the planet, land and sea by 2030. Thank you. Tom, I listened carefully to your remarks and I couldn't help but think of an old saying, the apple falls close to the tree. <laughs> uh, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, and I think what I should really say is, well done. I am ready to follow. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. <clears throat> but of course, you're not going to get off that easy. Uh, when I got a call in 1993, uh, the president advising me that he was going to nominate me to be Secretary of the Interior, the first call I got that same morning was from Stuart Udall. Uh, and he said, Bruce, I want to come over to Phoenix right now and talk. He was in Santa Fe. And I said, uh, Stuart, we're on the telephone. We could talk. <laughs> Uh, and he said, no, no, it'll never do. But he had this thing about the telephone. He didn't like it. He was going to be in person. He showed up the next day. And we had a long talk. It was the beginning of a remarkable eight years in which he would come by uh, to the office that he had once occupied, uh, usually kind of unannounced. <laughs> uh, he'd just show up. And it was often at the end of the day when he knew that things would be kind of quieting down and we could talk. Uh, and we had those talks. I listened a lot because what I wanted was to reminisce, reminisce about all the problems that I'd been through that day. He was obviously there for a different reason, and that was to kind of elevate my thinking try to broaden my perceptions. Um, just a couple of examples. I, I loved his view of the bureaucracy that I was stuck in. Uh, <laughs> he, he basically said, don't worry about all those bureaucratic lines. Feel free to trample all over them and to run up into other people's turf. Because being Secretary of the Interior is about managing the natural world and our relation to it. He knew what he was saying. He was really the founder of the Environmental Protection Agency. He put together the clean air and clean water issues way ahead of what actually happened uh, in the bureaucracy. The same thing with energy. He was a precursor of the Department of Energy by, by a generation. And his job was to reach and reach. I was curious about uh, the quiet crisis uh, because uh, I wasn't entirely clear about why that was going to become such a monumental piece of American history. Uh, discussing it, what I finally drew from that and began to understand was he was passionate about history because he saw in American history and in conservation history the strands of an evolutionary progression in American history. And he was saying to me, Bruce, you're not originating anything. You're building on what went before you, and you need to understand it, and it'll empower you to do your job. The last time I saw Stu was a wistful occasion. We were spending time in Santa Fe, and Hattie and I invited him over to dinner. We went up to his house on Cruz Blanca and brought him over to our residence and started dinner, and it was, it was a remarkable experience. He was losing his eyesight, and Hattie very carefully cut his meal up for him, and we began talking. And I, of course, um, wanted to talk about his legacy. 
and he was having none of it, absolutely none of it. What he, what he wanted to talk about was that letter to his grandchildren. And I quickly understood that it was a letter to his grandchildren, but it, it was a letter really to all of us. It was a, a letter to the next generation. Uh, and what he was doing in that letter, apart from talking about his own uh, career, was moving up to the issue of climate change uh, in a really passionate way and drawing into that his own conservation experience and starting to lay out this connection, a world climate crisis, which was also a world conservation, biodiversity crisis, and the way in which the two relate, that in working that conservation achievement in the agenda, we were playing into the human approach to climate change. Uh, a remarkable uh, kind of connection. And as I stand here today, I see that vision taking shape in his son's legislative proposal called 30 by 30. Thank you. The acts are getting tougher and tougher to follow up here. <laughs> My name is Sally Jewell. It's a privilege to be back here at the epicenter of the Fifth Estate. So thank you, media. Thank you, National Press Club, for bringing and shining a spotlight on things that are so important to all of us. And it's not an easy time for you, and I really, really appreciate you. Um, let me also give a shout out to uh, another group of people that I deeply respect who are having a tough time right now, and that is public servants. If you've served in public service, could you just raise your hands in this room? Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you. I just see people toiling away day in and day out with these r radical swings of the pendulum between different ideologies and different administrations, and it is just darn tough to keep your eye on the prize and recognize that you are in the forever business. You're not in the business for four years, so thank you, public <laughs> servants. I also want to say that uh, I was very proud to walk into the Stuart Lee Udall building every day and to walk past the portraits of Stuart Udall and Bruce Babbitt. So, um, and I did not fly a flag when I was in residence. I just <laughs> appreciated the, um, the people that had come before me, those that had done a good job and um, those that I did not really relish walking by, like James Watt, for example. Um, because it gave me a sense of just the, the importance of the position um, and uh, what can happen if you're not thinking about future generations, if you're not recognizing that um, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And that is the North Star that I thought about in the letter to the grandchildren, uh, which is powerful. Has he published that? Okay, I'm going to have to look at it. So. Um, it's an honor to be here in honor of Stuart Udall's birthday. Uh, it's also really late to be coming to the party and having this discussion, given what Enrique has told us. Stuart warned us, Rachel Carson warned us, she talked about the superhighway to destruction, um, and here we are, uh, really on the cusp, with the need to not just stop doing what we have been doing, but we repair what we have been doing. 30 by 30, means protecting the best, but it's also about improving the rest, improving the rest. How do we take the balance of our lands? Besides restoring the best, how do we take the balance of our lands and make them better, make them a place that can store carbon, make them a place that can restore habitat uh, for species? So it's a grand awakening right now. The last six months, oh my God, the last six months, the climate strike, the climate week, businesses all of a sudden waking up going, oh wow, my, my biggest investors are telling me I better be doing right by the planet 
or they aren't going to invest in me anymore. Larry Fink and BlackRock and his letter to investors and his letter to the businesses that he supported. Amazon stepping forward uh, and saying we want to be carbon neutral by 2040 and Nature Conservancy, will you please help us get there? That's happening all over. It's happening with other NGOs. Businesses are scrambling saying, wow, we need to be part of the solution. And frankly, uh, representing now the Nature Conservancy as interim CEO, we as NGOs need to get our act together and say, here is the path, because everybody is looking to take that path. Um, Tom Friedman wrote a few days ago in a column that I was reading on an airplane flight to uh, North Carolina about Mother Nature and her role in solving the challenges of the Middle East. Or more importantly, if we ignore Mother Nature, um, we will have huge problems emanating not from political conflict and, and religious conflict and, and uh, those sorts of things. We're going to have conflict over no water, no food, too many people, and what that looks like. So um, I don't want to be Debbie Downer up here, uh, but I just want to say uh, we, we better get going. All of us better get going. I'd say another thing, and we're going to hear about this perhaps in just a minute, uh, and that is that when we pull up and we look at this small blue planet that we share with a lot of people, that the best places are the places that the 30 percent that are most important to protect are the places that are still in the hands of indigenous people. They're in hands of people that recognize that they are part of the land. They are an, an, an animal among many animals, among many spirits that have kept this land in harmony. It has taken care of them. They have taken care of it. And I'm glad there's a grand awakening. Um, I wanted to tell James Watt every time I walked by his portrait that the value in Badger II medicine is not in oil. So we'll hear about that in a minute, perhaps, from Kendall. So what can we do? I really appreciate youth voices, led by the very powerful voice of Greta Thunberg, but so many more, like the students I met at Duke the uh, day before yesterday. Or maybe it was yesterday. <laughs> day before yesterday. <laughs> it's been a long week. Um, NGOs continue to convene, and we are one of them. They continue to protect. They continue to advocate. They continue to experiment to take the risk out of some things so that government can step in with a solution that works which is an important piece of the equation, but we need business and government and citizen activism and government at every levels and uh, indigenous communities all working together in this environmental super year. This year of the Convention on Biological Diversity that uh, Enrique mentioned, this year of another COP on climate in Glasgow, Scotland, and what hasn't been mentioned, this year of the High Seas Treaty with the UN, which is the law of the sea, which has the ability to do the sorts of things that Enrique talked about in that incredible picture that he had up there, uh, by recognizing that those marine protected areas, like the one that George W. Bush first protected and Barack Obama expanded, Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument and Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, if you're Secretary of the Interior, you better learn how to pronounce that. Um, <laughs> because you can go out there to <laughs> Global Fishing Watch, and you can see all the fishing activity around that monument, and you can see no fishing activity within that monument. And why do you think they're all around the periphery? They're there because that's where the fish are, because there's actually a functioning ecosystem that has bounced back really quickly within those marine protected areas. The High Seas Treaty this year is an opportunity to take that science from countries. The United States is a player, but by no means the biggest player, Palau and others, and say, what do we learn from this, and how do we structure most of the blue environment, which is in fact on the high seas and not controlled by any given uh, country. So lots of creative ways to do that. The Nature Conservancy is working with Wall Street and OPIC and different countries like the Seychelles to use blue bonds for nature, which reduces the interest rate of those countries on their national debt by guaranteeing a portion of it, of it and taking that interest rate differential and putting it specifically into um, habitat restoration, a sustainable habitat restoration, which drives the fishing, local indigenous fishing uh, industry, as well as tourism, which is so critical for their landscapes. 
as their coral reefs are really struggling at this time of climate change. So it's just one little example of um, the importance of engaging across all sectors so that you can protect that habitat like the watersheds above New York or Seattle that provide a clean water supply to the cities. How do you align the interests of the cities, the interests of the water providers, uh, with the interests of those who control the land upstream so that everybody wins? So I want to thank the Weiss Foundation for their campaign for nature, for their shining a spotlight on 30 by 30, for Senator Udall for his legislation, um, for the indigenous communities that have been trying to speak to all of us for so long about what we're getting wrong, and we need to listen to them about what we need to get right in order to protect the best and improve the rest. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kendall Edmo from the Blackfeet Nation. Thank you. Okay, my name is Kendall. Thank you for the intro, Sally Jewell. Wow, I just wanna say I am super stoked to be here and I feel very honored to be among the panel. Um, and also I wanna thank Carla Bird. She's a fellow Blackfeet just who happened to be in Washington DC at the same time. And I saw her on Snapchat and I was like, hey girl, come over and watch me speak. So I feel a little piece of home has come with me. So thank you so much. So I wanna acknowledge the Udall family legacy the Udall family has been working at the intersection of conservation and culture for generations, from Bears Ears to Blue Lake. Um, my nephew is um, part Taos Pueblo, so that I have a special connection, and so does he, to that area. Today marks an opportunity to build on, upon that legacy for a new conservation future. 30 by 30 represents a tremendous opportunity for tribal communities to protect our homelands both on and off the reservations, and to do so on our terms. It's an opportunity to reset the, to reset the conservation model and to incorporate tribal sovereignty with new designations that honor, protect, and enhance tribal treaty rights. The next century of conservation will need to transform to be more inclusive of indigenous views every step of the way. In terms of the challenges that 3030 presents to tribal communities, I think primarily traditional conservation has separated local indigenous communities from our homelands. When in fact, tribal communities have unique and living connections and relationships to our homelands that reach back for thousands of years. As the Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Blackfeet Nation, I have visited sites that date back for over 13,000 years of Blackfeet occupation. If we're going to achieve 30 by 30, we are going to be working on many people's homelands that date back for millennia. Conservation will have to evolve quickly if we are going to ensure that cultural and ecological integrity remains intact for future generations. This can't be achieved through the traditional wilderness and national park designations. So I'm gonna tell you a little story about what I mean. There's this place called the Badger Two Medicine. Maybe you guys have heard of it. It's named after Badger Creek and the Two Medicine River and is located adjacent to the Blackfeet Reservation, the Bob Marshall Wilderness and Glacier National Park. It's a place where rolling foothills meet the mountains. Since time immemorial, it has been a place of prayer, fasting and ceremony for the Blackfeet people. When the US government outlawed our traditions, it is where my ancestors went to practice our ceremonies in peace. It is the last refuge of Blackfeet culture. In the early 1980s, which may or may not have been the decade I was born, I don't know, <laughs> the government leased the Badger for oil and gas exploration. Tribal leaders and people in my community have been fighting to rid the leases ever since. And thinking back on it, I kind of think we were made for this fight. Um, we're, the Blackfeet are known on the plains to be relentless on intruders. So I, th I think I fit right in. <laughs> and we didn't do it alone. We had help from our valued conservation partners, many whom have become my close and trusted friends, an outstanding archeologist who with the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer saw the value in documenting our place-based oral histories, 
And more recently, the Honorable Secretary Sally Jewell, who was instrumental in canceling the last of those leases before she left office. <laughs> We are no longer defending against uncertainty and threat to our homelands. Now we are imagining what is possible and what is next for the Badger. And we can finally turn our focus and energy towards permanent protection of that landscape. That will mean conservation protection of wildlife and habitat, but it will also mean cultural protections. And that includes treaty rights, traditional uses, and Blackfeet co-management with the US government. Without cultural landscape preservation, wildlife, wildland conservation is incomplete. And this is what I mean by the need for a new conservation model. For the last century, conservationists have written designations for our land that didn't meet the needs of our communities. Now this is an opportunity for us to write those designations for, for those lands and incorporate the full depth of cultural landscapes. For tribal communities, 30 by 30 represents a tremendous opportunity to get it right this time and to conserve more than just the wild nature. Thank you. inspires action, and action sparks change. Change that can conserve a critical habitat by pushing against the current. Change that can save a species by mobilizing a community. Change that can solve a whole ocean of challenges. Together, we can create a healthier and more sustainable future. for being here. And we couldn't be more excited to have such a distinguished group of people joining us today. So can we give him one more round of applause? <laughs> and to get us started, since we are here honoring Stuart Udall, it's only fitting that we start with his son, Senator Tom Udall, to open up our panel discussion. And Senator, you recently wrote an op-ed in High Country News about your father's legacy, as he was one of the first people to warn about the conservation crises in the 1960s, among his many other accomplishments. But can you talk a bit more about how we might use his legacy to meet the urgent conservation challenges we face today? You bet. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. I, I um, first just want to say a couple of things here in, in the big picture on this. In the 50s and 60s, you've got to go back and kind of imagine. I know, um, uh, Kendall, it may be hard because you weren't <laughs> here, but, but there are a few people with gray hairs here that, that like understand. In the 50s and 60s, and, and even into the 70s, there was this kind of sense that uh, economic development, the economics, people's well-being, people themselves, that was the the... Um, the biggest issue. It took precedence when you dealt with public lands and dealt with 
uh, streams and waters and all this over everything else. And I think it was really the people. Dad never, just like Bruce was saying, Dad never thought it was all him. He always gave a lot of credit to the movement, the movement that was out there that was pushing, that was saying, look what you're doing. You have air uh, that's polluted in the cities. Uh, you're dumping all your sewage in, in, and uh, various pollutants and things in the rivers. Uh, the, the Lake Erie and the Cuyahoga River were on fire. Uh, you had all these things happening around people and this movement started and my dad was at that critical point. And so he, he was the one that kind of came out and said, no, no, we're not, the economics do not have to be the top. We can do both. And so that's where it, the, this movement started and we need to keep the movement going. And, and we need to keep it going in so many areas. But let, let's, uh, I don't want to go on too long because we've got a lot of panelists here sure. and we're going to have a long time to talk. And Secretary Babbitt, to build up on that, um, Senator Udall's accomplishments such as overseeing the addition of four national parks, six national monuments, eight national seashores, and 56 national wildlife refuges was quite bold for his time. Um, but it's gonna take a similar level of boldness to meet the nature crisis that we're facing today. How do we reinvigorate that level of engagement and activism that we saw in the 1960s and 70s? I'd like to just say another word or two about 30 by 30, because I think that framework provides kind of a synthesizing and consolidating and organizing possibility. But we've got to put some life into it because it's easy to think of it as just another slogan uh, and to think, well, that's a climate goal out there uh, and it'll take care of itself. To put some content into it, we really have to get after the biodiversity, conservation, land protection, restoration concepts and show people how it is that their local efforts and their engagement on the ground makes a difference in terms of climate change and the extent in which 30 by 30 is of course an important planetary objective for biodiversity. We've heard uh, Eric and others speak uh, quite uh, convincingly about that. We have to translate it into an international consolidated movement which talks about how this plays uh, in the climate. Uh, th th that's why I talked about in a letter to his grandchildren. I think he was coming up to that. And frankly, I don't think we've done a very good job of putting the two together. I think this legislation, <laughs> Senator, uh, is a perfect beginning. And we gotta, we gotta sell it both uh, as a slogan and a, and a concept that has real content to it. Yeah. And, and part of this, and Dad said this in one of his most famous quotes that's out there, it's from Agenda for Tomorrow, the, the, the book he wrote uh, a little later on than Quiet Crisis, and he said, efforts to protect um, air and water and wilderness and wildlife are in fact, and I'm paraphrasing because he said at the time he said, are to protect man. He, he always loved women and he would have, he would have <laughs> changed, he's gonna allow me to change the quote and say to protect human beings. But that's what we have to realize. It's those ecosystems that, that really support all of us. These, many of these great environmental groups, when they talk now about nature, they talk about ecosystems and ecosystem services that are provided from the ecosystems to human beings. But they're, they're important in their own right because they are, are what allow us to sustain uh, nature and sustain the earth. And Enrique, building on top of that, um, how, what are the economic benefits of national parks and monuments? I know you talked a bit about that in your opening um, presentation, but how are these nature-based solutions also important for the climate? Yes, but first, if I may, Sally mentioned the Pacific Islands Remote um, 
Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument and Papahanamu Kuakea. Nice job. I'm candidate for. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> yeah. And I'd like to give a shout out to John Podesta, who was absolutely the sure. person at the White House, Obama White House, to, to make that expansion possible. So thank you. <laughs> So, you know, what we're doing now is, you know, that, that uh, argument about, oh, we, we have to develop, you know, we cannot protect more because we have to grow and, you know, worship the golden idol of GDP growth. It's like we are trying to make as much money as possible in the casino of the Titanic after hitting <laughs> the iceberg. <laughs> and, um, you know, economically, we have, a, by the way, we have a study coming a report coming out in March as part of the campaign for nature uh, that calculates for the first time the cost and the benefits of protecting 30% of the ocean and the land. And what we have seen, usually you go to the Minister of Finance, say, oh, we want to protect this. So how much is it going to cost? Mm -hmm. And all they see is the opportunity cost, the foregone uh, fishing revenue, or the timber that we could have you know, uh, logged and, and sold and also the management costs of these national parks and, and protected areas. But they, we have been really bad at, at adding the benefits to that equation. So in the ocean, we have this fishing, right? And we have seen that uh, the value of protected areas, economic value, is one to seven, in the same way the national parks in the US is one to 10. Uh, the natural grasslands of, it's not just the economics. Right, the economics, we have, we have uh, many examples around the world. This uh, study is going to show that the actual costs are negative. Actually, there are net benefits. There will be a transition period where there will be short-term costs <coughs> to get to this point where nature is restored in such a way that the benefits will outweigh the opportunity costs, <coughs> right? Um, but it's more than just economics. It's about uh, people's health and people's, people's lives too. And just one example, the Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique has natural grasslands that are maintained by the grazing, natural grazing of the natural herbivores. Cyclone Idai in Mozambique last year uh, killed more than 2,000 people, tremendous floods, except in the Gorongosa National Park because the natural grasslands were able to retain a volume of water equal to 800,000 Olympic swimming pools. That's a service that we don't pay for, that nobody thinks about. But think about the, the, the infrastructure, the villages, and the lives that were saved. You know, how can you quantify this? So we cannot turn everything into dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Economically, it's clear that protected areas are going to provide greater benefits than we have now, but it goes beyond evaluation. In Secretary Jewell, the national park system is known as America's best idea. Why is that true? And can you talk a bit more about the importance of a program like the Land and Water Conservation Fund? You know, it's so interesting. Um, it was America's best idea when it was created over 100 years ago because we had unfettered access to, humans had unfettered access to exploit things like Niagara Falls, which is not a national park. It is, uh, became kind of a carnival barker site and that's where Yellowstone was going, which was uh, really the first, even before the National Park Service was created, set aside. And you can imagine uh, what was happening and what would have happened if it wasn't protected. So it was America's best idea when it was created in 1916. But we have evolved over time to recognize that national parks are still important, but they're postage stamps of biodiversity and protection in a landscape that requires something much more connected and bigger than a postage stamp. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Kendall talked about where Badger II medicine is located. Bob Marshall Wilderness, Glacier National Park, Blackfeet Nation. Um, but it's not just about land protection, it's about recognizing where it fits in a bigger picture, what, where, what is important for indigenous communities and why, what is important for other species. And I would say that uh, using example of Bears Ears National Monument, which we hope will work its way through the courts and end up with the right decision. That was um, a national monument created in a very different way from the national parks of the past, the national monuments of the past, which were more focused on the natural world uh, and you know, a, there's a tourism element and, and sort of special places. This was created in recognizing many, many 
facets of that landscape, including how humans had interacted with that landscape, which of course now has been rescinded by the current administration and is working its way through courts. Uh, same with Grand Staircase Escalante, which uh, Bruce Babbitt um, courageously worked on um, protecting with uh, President Clinton. Um, I think it is, it, presidents can move quickly and protect areas that are under threat of development, whether it's mining or uh, exploitation. They play a really important role in that. But I think we uh, have evolved to understand that there's so much more in terms of um, the tools in the toolbox to really get to this 30 by 30. So Antiquities Act, uh, national park designations, um, recognition of tribal trust and treaty rights, uh, understanding of ecosystems, educating the public and the landowners, no matter who they are, is really important if we're going to achieve this 30 by 30. So it's an important tool in the toolbox. Um, it's an evolving understanding that we have of landscapes. And just a, a quick example in Canada that happened just in the last year is a, a project that Nature Conservants worked on for over 10 years called Faidene Nene. It is uh, with a uh, indigenous First Nation in the Northwest Territories, six and a half million acres set aside. They are the land manager. TNC raised money in an endowment to make sure that the indigenous rangers would be there. It's adjacent to 18 million, areas, uh, acre, 18 million acres of protected landscape. It's six and a half million acres. So together, huge portion of critical uh, boreal forest landscape in Canada, thinking bigger and differently. And I think that there's lessons learned there, uh, north of the border and in other countries that we can apply here to say, how do we take that best idea of national parks of 1916 and evolve it to achieving 30 by 30 or 50 by 50? So I did a panel with uh, um, E.O. Wilson about half earth. I mean, we've got to set our sights high and we have to get creative and using the tools in the toolbox, but, but um, allowing them to evolve is really important. Thank you. And Kendall, can you talk about what your journey has been in conserving Blackfeet tribal land? And as a millennial, do you feel an increased sense of urgency that's fueling your work? Sure. So my journey began with um, the Badger Two Medicine. I was hired as a community organizer by National Parks Conservation Association. And I remember being on the phone with Mr. Michael Jamison, and he says, you have to talk to John Murray. He's a tribal historic preservation officer. So I set up a meeting to talk um, to John Murray, and we met at our local casino. And we met during lunchtime. And I don't know if Sally's been there, <laughs> but it's super busy. I could barely hear him. And I was sitting, I was leaned in, sitting very closely, and he was just laying out the entire history of our tribe's fight for Badger II medicine. And I was very fascinated because um, in my community at you know, just like five years ago, it really a lot of people didn't know about what was going on um, in the Badger II medicine. And I just remember like scribbling in my notebook, like these notes, um, and, I, and I was trying to hear them, and it was so loud. And if I had known, um, I would have heard the same story hundreds of times the next five years. I probably would have taken less notes that day. <laughs> um, but I soon became um, employed at the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, and it was through this work that I gained a deep sense of cultural connection. And I would just sit there and I'd listen to John's stories. Um, he would tell traditional stories, um, Nopi stories, um, not stories of our origin, um, stories that aren't appropriate for this room. <laughs> and, and we'd go out onto the landscape and I learned how to identify bison drive lines, um, teepee rings, and that education is, so valuable and it's no and it's, it's something I hope to pass down to my children and I hope it transcends generations um, so I just gained such a deep sense of cultural identity through this work and I got to see part of my culture that not a lot of people get to see I mean I'm out um, on the during the summers driving on a side-by-side -side, GPS in cultural sites getting to see the mountains looking into the badger looking into a glacier documenting our cultural heritage and it, that has been probably the most special journey for me. 
um, in this, and um, that has been my journey in conservation. So. That's great. Miro, mm -hmm. can, yeah. I, can I respond to something here? Because mm -hmm. I think it's something that my dad seeing this panel mm -hmm. would talk about, and I mentioned it a little, but I just want to flesh it out. Seeing Kendall talk and knowing about and Sally mentioned it too, the native wisdom about the land, which we've really lost as a, as a, as a culture. They have not lost it, but we, and it's there. And the, the environmental movement of the 50s and 60s and 70s uh, it was, was in some ways a very Anglo kind of, as we'd say in New Mexico, exclusive movement. And, and the environmental movement of today needs to reflect America. It needs to be, it, it, it needs to be a movement that reflects the diversity of America. It needs to be about inclusion. My, my uh, little state of New Mexico, we're, we're where we're headed. New Mexico's a majority minority state with our Native American population, our Hispanic population that by the way is from Spain, many of them have been there Enrique for 400 years, and so before <laughs> Jamestown and before Plymouth. So, so that's the kind of thing that we're looking at in terms of the future. And, and I think if he were sitting here, he would be very proud of the group, and, and, and he would be very proud that, that uh, Kendall, your story about being inspired and then getting engaged, and that we're going to have a more diverse movement in front of us. Yeah. Kendall, to touch on that, what does conservation look like for the Badger 2 for the next 200 years? I'm so glad you guys changed that question. At first it was 20 years, and so I'm like, well, how about 200 years? That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so I have to say, conservation, um, it, for the Blackfeet Nation, I hope my ancestors can see the landscape and recognize it. I think that's what conservation means for the Blackfeet Nation. Um, I think it looks like my grandchildren's grandchildren riding back in the Badger on Blackfeet horses um, with their cousins and extended families passing by our traditional hunting grounds that are still being utilized today, um, going to go do ceremony. Um, I envision grizzly bears, elk, um, bison restoration in the Badger. Um, and I, I really think conservation just looks like a healthy community. Um, where Blackfeet have jobs, a sustainable economy, and where we still have res dogs running around, and I think Sally has seen <laughs> has experienced that. You have to keep the res dogs. <laughs> yes, I, they're healthy. Okay. <laughs> so I really think that all encaps encapsulates what um, conservation is. It really means a healthy community for our people and for future generations. Yeah, that's a beautiful vision. And Enrique, can I ask why is thirty percent? a 30% conservation goal specifically important? Well, it's a life support system, right? Um, I mean, how suicidal it is to continue destroying our life support system, right? It's like we are the hospital connected to all these machines and we keep unplugging machines and selling them so we can pay for the energy, energy bills. It doesn't make any sense, it's absolutely crazy. If an alien came to Earth and saw this, said, well, these guys are crazy, what are they doing to their se themselves, right? And why 30 by 30? Well, the goals we have now, 10%, 17%, were purely political. There was bargaining between countries, and there are countries that are pushing against any special targets, right? Right now, it's Brazil, for example, among others. Um, and we have a study coming up Soon also, we, you know, we, we don't have more land and ocean protected because there is a perceived cost to business. In the ocean, there is a perceived cost to fishing. So we have done this global analysis together with the head, chief scientists of the Nature Conservancy and others, uh, scientists and economists, and, and shown that if we protected around 40% of the ocean, fully protected, that would give us two thirds of the biodiversity benefits, but also, that would boost global fisheries productivity worldwide. We would get more fish out of the ocean if, if we protected the right 40%. And also, we would secure the carbon stocks that are so important for mitigating climate change. So uh, this is why 30% is just a milestone. Mm -hmm. you know, as Sally said, it's, you know, we need to think about 50 by, by 50 also. So that's why it's so important. It's as important as the cl Climate Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think 30% is the right figure because it's doable. We've got a target that we can reach. It will require not only parks and protected lands, it's going to require restoration. Mm -hmm. And we've got to sort of draw communities together to all of their surroundings to ask, how do we not just stop the destruction, but how do we get on with restoration? Uh, Janie Clark is here. She'll remind us that this is the 25th anniversary of the restoration of the wolf to Yellowstone. Uh, one of the great sort of restoration moments. And we ought to take that and say it's not just about wolves. That's a great victory. But it's about restoring creation, biodiversity, mm -hmm. diversity, wildlife. And that can all be brought together. And we can get there. That 30% is doable. And Secretary Jewell, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to weigh in in terms of uh, kind of brass tacks. How do you do this? Um, yes, policies of protection are important. We've talked about a few of those. But, and we need to align the interests of people at every level with the interests of the environment. We need to create that path forward, which is both economically successful, which humans demand, but also environmentally sustainable, which humans need, but they don't understand why they need it or how much they need it. Mm -hmm. And so I talked a bit about preserve the best and, and improve the rest. Um, we have a better idea now about what areas to protect. Enrique said on the high seas, it's 40% to actually protect 30% just because of the, you know, the, the fish migration and all of those things. Um, how do you do that? How do you create incentives, and those are carrots and sticks, so that the industrial fishing industry becomes a partner in those efforts and recognizes that? It can be done, as I mentioned, with blue bonds and the Seychelles as one little example, on a small level, but how do you scale that and do it very quickly? How do you uh, improve the rest? So um, one of the challenges in the Amazon destruction is about food and destroying the forest. Yes, illegal logging is involved, but the motivation isn't illegal logging, it's land clearing for agriculture. And then they denude those landscapes and then they clear more land for agriculture. If we could do sustainable agriculture and we could take those denuded forest lands and, and restore them with thoughtful precision agriculture and the technology exists to do that, then not only do you not uh, support destruction of the rest, you be, you, you, um, of the best rather, you begin to improve the rest. Um, so engagement with the business sector, proving up concepts, changing policies so that the businesses are not penalized for doing the right thing by the environment. Mileage standards in cars would be a good example where levels of playing field, everybody knows how they have to compete and it drives innovation. So those are the kinds of things that intersection of the economy and business and investment um, and reputational risk and all of those levers that need to be used to align those incentives. So it's not just being done by, by government, um, by fiat, because I don't think that's sustainable. Um, it is being done because you align those interests economically with the interests of the environment. And, and we also need to remove the disincentives and this is another uh, um, area where governments are key. Protecting 30% of the planet might cost about $100 billion per year. Every year, the money's there, but we are using it to subsidize the activities that destroy our support system, life support system. $700 billion go to industrial agriculture every year. Only 1% of those $700 billion goes to activities that do not destroy the soil or the environment or create dead zones downstream. Uh, burning fossil fuels is subsidized globally with $5.3 trillion every year. Yes. You know, and the International Monetary Fund has estimated that, you know, valued, which is an underestimate, that every year the natural world produces $125 trillion in free services to the global economy. So I would think that $100 billion, which is a fraction of the subsidies to activities that destroy biodiversity, 
invested in preserving our $125 trillion life support system, I think it's a pretty good investment. Yeah, it's a very good investment, very good investment. That's, that's, that's terrific. And I, and I think I, I, and we've all hit on this a little bit, but I, I think when it comes to climate and the CO2 and the greenhouse gas emissions, we need to look at the, at the big picture of what ecosystems do there. Because if, you, you're, if you're doing all these other things with cars and with putting a price on carbon and everything else, but if you have healthy ecosystems, they absorb an incredible amount of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. And that's why what Bruce said is so important is getting, getting to restoration. We've, we have degraded uh, many, many of these ecosystems so much. And Sally, as you know, we all, we've got to get to restoration, which is, a, was, which is a massive effort in itself. But as soon as you give nature a chance, you give mother nature a chance, she's very resilient and she comes back. Can I just point out something to, to build on uh, one of the comments Enrique made? There are something like 30 tax subsidies to the fossil fuel industry that have been around for 40 years that I tried to repeal, Bruce tried to repeal, um, I'm sure Tom tried to repeal. Yeah. <laughs> there is, a, I mean, the amount of money that comes from the fossil fuel industries into this city, the people that represent us in this city, is extraordinary. And every time we try and level the playing field by just removing the subsidies that presently exist for fossil fuels, it is undermined. We don't necessarily have to do incentives for renewable energy if we just get rid of the incentives that have an unlevel playing field for fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy. Bruce worked for eight years to try and update the you know, Mining Act of 1872, <laughs> right? And we, we didn't get that. We give our, our minerals away without uh, paying attention to the, the impact on the environment and the destruction of our habitat. It, it is not that complicated if we um, recognize the value of ecosystem services. And another very quick example, tangible example, that Nature Conservancy is involved in is it's called water funds. So for example, I was in Colombia where we are working with indigenous communities upstream in the watersheds, providing economic benefit to them that is paid for by the municipalities downstream, the large cities like Cali and Bogota and others that benefit from a healthy watershed. So you're actually transferring money from the city that wants healthy water to the communities upstream that then provides the economic benefit to them of the ecosystem services. And this is replicable, it's economic, it's aligning the interests of our urbanizing population with those who control the lands in um, whatever way they do. And it's, uh, you know, I think it's a wave of the future. So more publicity on these kinds of things, more legislation that just levels the playing field and recognizes the value of Mother Nature. Uh, and, the, and the business, you know, um, businesses will go there because they'll see an economic return. Sally, you said the word fossil fuels. Let's get started on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and the question is, where do we begin? A good place to begin is public lands. Right. Um, the, the leasing of public lands for fossil fuels uh, is economically unnecessary. It is hugely destructive of ecosystems. Um, and it is a public resource. Uh, and I think that adds up to support for uh, the proposals that we should have and fight for a moratorium on all leasing of fossil fuels on public lands, period. Yeah. Because there's your connection between healthy ecosystems, which are being destroyed unnecessarily, uh, and carbon uh, in the atmosphere. They, they, some of you may wonder, you know, 3030 sounds new. Does it really have any support? I just want to hit a couple of things here that I think are important. Big public support for a third of the. 30% by 2030, recent poll found 86% of the American public supporting it. All of the presidential candidates are supporting it. Uh, Senators Bennett, Booker, Harrison, Warren, except for Trump, of course. But the, 
<laughs> the, Senators Bennett, Booker, Harris, and Warren were original co-sponsors. Sanders and Klobuchar just signed up. Vice President Biden and Steyer uh, have built it into their platforms. Look for it, it's right there, and I'm happy to announce today with my hard work and my staff here that Mayor Pete Buttigieg and Mayor Mike Bloomberg are signing on it too. So we got all of the major candidates. I like to scale globally, internationally. We, the, with the WIS campaign for nature, we've been working with uh, the government of Costa Rica and France, and they are building a high ambition coalition for, for nature that is going to be um, made public officially at the World Conservation Congress in June. And right now there are already 25 countries supporting 30 by 30 as a global target, and the list is growing too. Great. 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 Fantastic. Well, time has really flown by. We're out of it, <laughs> it turns out. But I just wanted to thank all of you for joining us today. And I wanted to thank all of our wonderful panelists for taking the time to be here. You've been great. And also thank you to National Geographic, the Weiss Campaign for Nature, Senator Tom Udall and his wonderful staff for helping to put on this great event. And I'm Miro Karenho with Our Daily Planet. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.